Good morning, everyone. Graduates, families, friends, dear friends, many of you are here today. I am deeply, deeply honored to be here on this stage among esteemed colleagues and friends. I understand that the always excellent professional staff of the provost office is in fact all assembled up in the boxes in this great hall and that's both wonderful and a bit alarming <laughs> because I'm wondering who is working through the budget right now. But it is particularly satisfying to be standing here as the first woman provost and vice president academic of Memorial <laughs> University. The great Indian Canadian filmmaker Deepa Mehta, who in fact brought her film adaptation of Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children to this very arts and culture stage three years ago, always likes to say that she loathes the word humble. She has no time for anyone who says they are humbled to be where they are. Be real, be honest, Mehta says, forget humble. Okay, because I greatly admire Deepa Mehta, I'm not going to say I'm humbled. But I will say I am really, honestly happy to occupy such an important role at Memorial after more than three decades of working here in this wonderful cultural laboratory known as the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. I feel strongly committed to this university and its future and can think of no better place to be than right here and right now, celebrating the achievements and triumphs of an extraordinarily talented, bright, and hardworking group of students. Thank you for the honor and indeed the privilege of occupying this office. It is not without a measure of irony that I stand here reflecting on the one and only job I have ever been fired from so far. I was an undergraduate at McGill in Montreal many, many years ago looking for a summer job. I landed one selling newspapers, it was the Montreal Gazette to be exact, by cold calling unsuspecting potential customers. It was a deeply humiliating experience in every conceivable way. We sat in grey styrofoam cubicles in a large open room. Every time we scored a subscription, we had to push a bell on our desk, signaling our accomplishment. As my first day on the job rolled out, I could hear the steady ping, ping, ping of bells going off all over the room. My bell never rang. Instead of persuading customers of the value of subscribing to the Gazette, I was subjected to a long list of invective and profanity by those victims whose lives I had disturbed. And I was called every curse under the sun, some of which I had never heard of or even imagined to be physically possible. <laughs> At the end of the day, the boss, who upon reflection looked like that guy who plays Call Saul, you know, Walter White's sleazy lawyer, he brought me into his office and he fired me. Clearly, I didn't have what it took to sell anything. Frankly, I can't remember what I did the rest of that summer, but I licked my wounded pride and resolved not only never to be fired again from any job, but more importantly, never to work at a job I hated or wasn't able to succeed at. Perhaps that's easier said than done, but there's nothing like disappointment and a bit of humiliation to put starch in your backbone, and that was one of the turning points for me. Certainly as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student, I experienced, as many do, a fair share of disappointment and a certain measure of humiliation because, of course, that's what graduate school is often really good at. But I never once wavered from my commitment to finishing my programs and getting my degrees. I was hungry for knowledge and could not imagine I could be happier anywhere than at a university. In my case, first McGill, then the University of Alberta, and then finally, the University of Western Ontario. Surrounded by really smart and even some dumb people who made me feel smarter. All of us, all of us committed to the life of the mind. And that's what you have all done. You have endured disappointment, and in some cases, even humiliation, 
And through your success, despite that, you have brought yourself to this special moment. Don't kid yourself, it's a big deal just getting through, and you should feel really, honestly good about that. More particularly, I'm speaking right now to the Bachelors of Arts graduates, at least those from A to M, who have not only achieved their degrees, but who have had to endure the tired question, often tediously said, like a common refrain, what is the value of an arts degree? Is there a more boring question in circulation? Look, I'm a proud BA graduate, in English no less, a discipline that still teaches texts written long before the invention of the cell phone, or even of the toilet. <laughs> but through literature, and then by extension through film and expressions of cultural, culture itself, I came to appreciate and value the meaning of story and the way our lives are shaped by narratives of identity and meaning. The discipline of English also opened me up to the relation between individual identity and the social forces that inform it, and in turn again to the significance of language, of performance, of communication, upon which so much meaning rests. The more I studied, the more cross and interdisciplinary my interests became. I started to see the connections between the disciplines and the ways they could complement and enrich each other. Today, I remain firmly committed to encouraging at Memorial that kind of inter and even transdisciplinary awareness. And I would love to see Memorial encourage more cross fertilization of ideas across all of the units on our campuses. In effect, what I learned from my BA besides how Shakespeare rocked or Margaret Atwood ruled, was a set of public skills, public skills, that have taken me on and up through to this very moment and this very stage. Your professors might not have told you directly that you were acquiring those skills, but you have. Whether a sociologist or an anthropologist, geographer, linguist, and so on, you understand and you appreciate the complexity of language you know that finding the right question is really the first step to knowledge. That you have to be open to multiple points of view to see your way through a problem. And that there is far, far more to learn than any of us can ever hope to know. So class of 2015, a BA is a precious, privileged thing. And no moment of your time has been wasted. And I say realistically, honestly, that it will serve you well as you move into what we commonly call the next chapter of your life, as I draw on the very metaphor of the book and of the story to make sense of your journey. To the freshly minted PhDs from all disciplines, I hope you are feeling as good about your achievement as I did when I got mine. I can still thrill at the memory of that accomplishment especially again as a woman entering the then largely male-dominated field of doctoral success. That memory is right up there, as fresh as the memory of my first kiss and other rare and best left unmentioned moments of discovery. <laughs> we know that today almost two-thirds of PhDs in Canada will find work outside the university academy in industry and business, in the not-for-profit sector, in law, in health services, trade, management, in government. You will be all over the rich map, marshalling your skills to do your best at whatever you do. And remember, too, that while you have gone deep, becoming an expert on a problem or question in a particular area of study, you have also gone broad, learning ever more about how to question and challenge received ideas, how to think critically, thoughtfully, and creatively about how to make this world better. You have rich disciplinary skills, true, but as with the BA graduates, you have acquired all the right and necessary public skills that cross all disciplines. Use them wisely. The 21st century in which we will all be living longer and in more complicated ways needs you. Finally, I would say there are probably thousands of convocation addresses that say the same thing, and they harness the same cliches, such as, remember, anything is possible. Take risks, follow your passion, dream big, 
go forth and prosper, resist dogma, love what you do, set goals, stay the course, share your knowledge, yada, yada, yada. Sure, I would happily urge all of these cliches on you, but I won't, because you have to get lucky too. I will conclude, however, with one piece of advice gleaned from personal experience. Several years ago, when I was first considering a leadership role as president of the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, I asked my husband, Stephen Bornstein, also an academic, sitting up there in the lower box. He's my best friend, my true love, continual inspiration, favorite partner, cherished soulmate. I asked Stephen, should I go for the presidency of the Federation? What do you think? And he said, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> so I didn't listen to him, and I went for it. <laughs> and then, wait, wait. A few years later, I was asked to consider becoming then Associate Dean of Graduate Studies. So I turned to the very wise Dr. Bornstein again. And I said, Stephen, should I go for it? And he said, once again, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> and so I didn't listen, and I went for it. So that refusal and resistance led to my becoming the Dean of Grad Studies, and eventually to the very possibility of becoming Provost and Vice President Academic. By then, of course, I knew better than to ask him, and he knew better than to advise. Thank you, Stephen, for being so wrong in your otherwise. <laughs> for, being, for being so wrong in your otherwise perfect record of advice and generous wisdom. You know I love you more than ever and everything, but it's so much fun when you get it wrong. <laughs> and so the best advice for everyone in the graduating class of 2015 is don't always listen to your partner. Thank you and good luck. <laughs>